so excited to share this beautiful, brilliant soul with you in this week's Language of Love conversation, Catherine Woodward Thomas. She's a marriage and family therapist. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling uh, book, Conscious Uncoupling, Five Steps to Living Happily Even After. It was made really famous by, I mean, it should have been famous either way, but it was made famous by Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, and she also wrote the national bestseller, Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life. She is, uh, she trains and certifies coaches um, and happens to be a dear, dear friend and also an amazing trusted teacher of mine. So welcome, Catherine Woodward Thomas. Oh, well, we're teachers to each other, Laura. Really. <laughs> I, when, whenever you start speaking, I just get quiet because I, I don't want to miss a word. Oh, I feel the same way. I think we met when I interviewed you years and years and years ago on a radio yeah. show I was doing um, was when we kind of met for the first time in person. But I had always followed your work and I had always recommended, and, and this is really what I want to focus on is calling in the one, because I have yet to find a book or a program that helps, that really helps in the way that I know helps people get clear about what they want out of love, remove the blocks in the way and literally call it in. So mm -hmm. I wanted to spend some time talking about that with you and about what you teach um, and also share with you all that um, Catherine, you know, a lot of her work and I've actually joined, you know, just been a visiting professor, so to speak on a couple of them, but a big part of your work is training, which I think is so cool is training coaches to yes. Big help part. people call in the one. Yes. Because it's not so easy to just read a book and do this, right? You can, and the book gives yeah. you a guide, but the part specifically, I think, about removing the blocks, you know, that can be hard to do on your own. Well, it, it first of all, holding possibility is really hard yeah. to do on your own, particularly, you know, with the, with the kind of crazy dating culture that we have that has so few rules mm -hmm. and uh, where, where online dating can be such a meat market and such a precarious place to, to try and look for love. Um, so holding possibility also because in the face of our history, you know, these patterns uh, were set up that were set up in early childhood. Yeah. They repeat and repeat and repeat. And so Ugh, most times yeah. when people come to me, they're pretty resigned that this could really happen for them. And every single person has a different reason. And somebody, you know, it's either my thighs are too big or my bank account's too low <laughs> or I'm too old or I have an autistic son or, you know, something. And I just find this really for everyone. So, you know, my feet are funny or whatever we have. Yeah, there's always something that makes always you some reason not, why. it's not going to happen for you. Exactly. And that's so what that's you mean by holding the possibility. Right. So I can get the book, you know, we can, the book has a lot of magic and the book really speaks to people. And when I share my story, because I come at this from the inside out, never thought that I would be a teacher of love. I thought maybe I'd be a teacher of spirituality. Yeah. That's actually what I was aspiring to. <laughs> and uh, because which love kind of are, but which yes. I am now. Yes. yes, absolutely. It's a very, very uh, spiritual program. It kind of integrates what I learned as a marriage and family therapist with transformational technologies and also uh, metaphysics, which we yeah. share in your beautiful yes. quantum love work. So I think that the value of, of being a coach and holding the high watch for people, being present with people in their resignation, in their story, in their feelings of overwhelm, like powerlessness around uh, not being able to create what they want, be deeply present, but to, it's almost like they know a little secret, like, yeah, but I got the roadmap that works. So yeah. we're going to get there. Well, I was just going to say, having been, you know, sometimes when, cause Catherine does a lot of these trainings, uh, you know, and there's actually one starting soon, I think, but I've come in, you've brought me in from time to time to talk about your guest faculty. Sex. Yeah, I'm guest faculty, faculty. That's what I am. And yeah. and what's what's really cool having experienced that because I've never I've trained therapists before, but I've never done online coach training or therapist training. What I think is really cool is that the process you take these coaches through, you know, they're learning to coach other people, but they're also getting healed and they're mastering their own love. love. 
Yeah, because I because re- what we're working with, Laura, is consciousness. You know, yeah. when we look at the the obstacles to love, there's really four main obstacles that we focus on. And by the way, I, I want to come back to the resignation piece because yeah. I, I actually can really speak to how to lift resignation. Okay, good. Pretty good, quickly. Good. Okay. But the, the four main obstacles to love, uh, the first three we can come back to, they're about completing the past. The the fourth one is the biggest one, and it's what I call your false love identity. Mm-hmm. And it's the, you know, it's the thing that we're all kind of wrestling with that that imprinting of I'm not wanted or I'm alone or I'm not good enough or I'm somehow not safe to be close and it's the it's kind of the core of the love uh the love addict patterns the codependent patterns the love avoidant the and why you attachment. end up attracting and being attracted to the same it is the that don't core serve of it and we actually take it down to you know it's almost like you're going to redo a house you just strip the house of all the walls you go right down to the down to the studs, studs down to the studs and um and we really we really name that what i call your source fracture story that's like the yeah. the, the original break in your heart that that broken belonging where you were all alone and you were, you know, too young to manage that with any, and certainly too young to understand why you were alone with Mm -hmm. any sophistication or complexity. So of course it comes down to identity formation. It gets very lodged into identity. So we really name that. And we have this whole process of how to wake people up who are kind of under the trance of that story. And we rec- and we actually point out how people specifically are the source of the story. That's the, that's what's been in the invisible that we make all yeah. of this very transparent. So we're working with consciousness. We're working with the uh, you know the, the 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 kind of contraction in the body that comes up with all of these disappointments in love and the resignation that's basically like somehow I'm on the outside looking in. I'll never have love. Love is for other people because I'm so deeply alone. And we really give people like this somatic waking up experience to it, to the deeper truth. And in this case, it might be something like, I didn't come here to be alone. I came here to love and be loved. And I have the power to learn how to have happy, healthy relationships that root down over time. Right. And so, so now you're in a different story that you can feel in your body deeper and wider and, and you're going to show up in very, very different ways. So we have to teach our coaches not to do that from an intellectual place. They have to go into that themselves. So what yes. happens for the coaches is they really become masters mm-hmm. at this technology. For themselves first. For themselves. And then they can teach other people, yes. For themselves. And a lot of people will come into the coach training, not even positive they're going to end up being coaches. They really want to master this themselves. And it's kind of the technology of how to transform any area of your life. But I love working in this area in particular, because it's the, it's the core one for most of us. You know, we're talking about, were you wanted by your mother when she found out she was pregnant with you? Yeah. Yeah. It can be that early. Yeah. It's really primitive. You know, I also think it's one thing you said, you know, I often talk about too, in a different way that that children by nature are narcissistic. That's just developmentally how they are. So everything that happens around them, even if it has nothing, no, they have nothing to do with it, but everything that happens around them and affects them is because of them, right? So when dad Definitely. abandons the family or when when mom has, you know, it, it is an alcoholic and can't show up for you or whatever it is, it's the child naturally thinks it's because I'm too much of something or I'm not enough of something, or if I, you know, this is my fault. Right. And then that gets like imprinted, as you were saying, in that identity formation. Right. And it never gets excavated and it never gets questioned. And you never sort of pull that dark thing out of the basement to look at it. And once you do, which is what I, one of the things that I think is so beautiful about the work you do with people is that with support and guidance, around not only doing that somatically, but, you know, and energetically, but even intellectually looking at it, you can suddenly see like, no, that's not true that dad left because, 
you know, he left because he met another woman and he couldn't deal, you know, he couldn't communicate with mom, you know, whatever it was, it had nothing to do with me. And so there's almost like a closure that happens and a new identity can form. Well, one of the things that I, I work with a lot is the relationship between that cognitive part of ourselves yeah. and the younger self in the yeah. body. Because yeah. what happens when we get disappointed in love is we usually kind of collapse into being overly identified with the feelings that we have. And the feelings yes. are what with that old interpretive lens. So it might occur like kind of a collapse into a low-grade depression, or it might occur like a deep anxiety that is kind of compelling you to, you know, pick up the phone and say something and which is, you know, intellectually is the worst thing to do, but right, you do right. it anyway. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So it, so it's driving how we show up. And here's the other piece of it, Laura, every single self schema is what I'm going to call it. Like I'm alone or I'm not good enough. They all have their own different flavor. Mm-hmm. And we, each have our own kind of primary one. And I found that there's about 22 of them that Hmm. are really kind of the most that we go to. You might have variations on a theme or you might have a relationship like my primary one is I'm invisible. And then I find out, well, I created invisibility because my dad was raging and it was a safety strategy. So the primary one is I'm not safe to be visible, right? But all of them have their own ways of relating that are actually keeping the story in place. So for the I'm invisible, your first attention might go to other people because you're sourcing your safety Mm -hmm. by seeing them. Yes, and And not being seen. And not being seen yourself. And you become almost invisible to yourself because your attention is so out here. And then we make choices from that place, even really beautiful ones. Sometimes, like I think most of us therapist types have some relationship. Oh my God, we all do. Right. We all do. Yes. Right. That's the primary one that, you know, so you can use them to good right. end, but, you know, but you still have to take the splinter out of your own soul. Mm-hmm. So what we do in calling in the one is we actually map out. So inside of the I'm alone, how are you the source of that experience? This is what breaks up resignation, by the way. So the pattern is I always get involved with people where I end up being their mother as opposed to their girlfriend right. or their partner. Right? Right? That might be the pattern. Yeah. And if, if you really feel into that, there's a there's maybe an I'm alone and no one ever really shows up for me because beliefs are not just about me, but it's about my relationship. Right. Um, so yes. who I am in relationship, well, no one's ever really there for me. So inside of that assumption, I just, my, the way I create connection is that I give, 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 which is mother position. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have a very big cup for receiving back. As a matter of fact, I don't maybe not even feel comfortable with the vulnerability. I don't even allow myself to receive. I don't even let it go there. What I do instead is I create myself as self-sufficient. I get a little prickly when people try and give to me. So I give them the message. I don't really need anything from you. I'm just here to give. And we literally train people to then be dependent. And there's not mutuality. In the and state. then we get resentful or hurt. But we're And then we'll scenario. spend 10 years on our own because yeah. it's either somebody's going to drain me or yeah. I'm just alone. And frankly, if you know, I bet no relationship is better than an unhealthy relationship. Yeah. I agree with that. So, so we're unpacking all this. So, so once you see it as, okay, I'm the one who's keeping this in place, because first of all, in my relationship with myself, I self-abandon all the time just to, you know, in the, in the fear that someone's going to leave me, I, I people please. Mm -hmm. So that's a self-abandonment. I don't even know what I feel, but I know what they feel Mm -hmm. and what they want. Yeah. That was my little tick. And then inside of the relational space, maybe I avoid conflict like the plague. So I'm always just kind of morphing into their world, like a little chameleon, but it doesn't let love root down because studies show that love roots down in conflict. So the relationship never really goes very deep and it's very easy for the other person to leave. Or um, I'm so self-sufficient that I just kind of train people that I don't need anything from them. So they don't even bother. They kind of give up and they're not trying to create mutuality. So that's probably a lot of those women who say, uh, I find men, you know, I intimidate men, 
right? Like, this oh, is what, yes. what that one, right? Those are the women that, that don't make room. They don't make room. Yeah. That's, that's beautifully noted. Yeah. So what, what actually begins to open up possibility and give us hope is for you when once you understand oh i'm the source of this and and by the way this is no small matter because how we're trying to fix it is forever going back with my mother and she left me alone and i was a latchkey kid and then my father and my he left our family and then you know and we're in the story and somehow we think if we kind of stay in the swamp of the story long enough that somehow it'll just kind of untangle that gnarly knot and we won't be this way anymore. But what, what we don't realize is that we ourselves formed our personality around yeah. what happened. Especially we, in love. Especially in love because it's yeah. so primal. Yeah. And we have to, once we break it up and you see, oh, I see, I'm creating this because I don't take the risk to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I pride myself on being self-sufficient. So inside of the new story, I didn't come here to be alone. I came here to love and be loved. And I have the power to create healthy relatedness. There's all of a sudden the pathway of development opens up. How am I going to, how, what do I need to grow and develop in my relationship with myself? Well, to always have my first attention here, to be able to start to put a label to every feeling I have to understand what I need to validate my healthy needs mm -hmm. and to care for that younger part of me that's, you know, anchored into some story of lack and limitation that would feed into neediness, right? So it's learning to become much more self-aware internally yeah. and to do what our friend Margaret Paul says, inner bonding, bonding with that younger self, mm -hmm. holding and containing our inner experience. And then in relationship with others to allow for two people to be in the room. Finally. Yeah. Sometimes you know, that starts if you're single, sometimes that starts with a friend or a colleague, definitely. right? You're practicing in these other ways. We, you almost have to be proactive. Like, yeah. okay, well, if I never do anything where I need somebody, let me take on a project that requires three people. Yeah. <laughs> that I'm going to possibly someone. do that alone. Yeah. Just so yeah. I have to get out of my identity, you know, part of why manifesting love is so challenging for so many of us is that it's literally outside of our identity to receive and to sustain. Yeah. Because we don't have an identity that, that lines up with deserving love and being right. worthy of that. Yeah. Yeah, we don't. I mean, I for love me that you've like honed yeah. it down to 22 flavors and variations. That's really cool. And they all have, they are flat there. I, I think of them like ice creams, you know, mm -hmm. the ice cream story You have the mm -hmm. Rocky road, you have the strawberry, you have the vanilla, the butterscotch, they all taste a little different. It's all ice cream, but yeah. there are very specific ways. So for example, in the, I'm not safe, there's a way that you'll come into a conversation with a projection. I'm really interested in what we're projecting onto others, the automatic assumption about others and how others will feel about us. Mm -hmm. So there's this feeling that other people want something from me, right? right? Other we're people have some kind of intent. They're going to, they're going to take something from me. And then you're speaking through that. You're saying, you know, can I have a glass of water, please? Well, I'd like a glass of water too, please. Yeah. <laughs> And then you don't understand why you're turning people off, right? And then nobody, went, like, people ready to scream me from the room or they're prickly with you or they're defensive and argumentative yeah. and you think it's them. It doesn't occur for us. We're almost yeah. blind to this self as source piece. Yes. How do you help people? In, you know, I, I'm assuming it's like in vivo and in the moment, but how do you help people through this process and become aware well, right from the get-go, we, we invite people to identify, well, first of all, the, the real get-go is what's the future you're standing for. Mm -hmm. We're so used to doing our inner development by looking back. And I use the positive possible self of the future as often yeah. as I can. Amen. And even yeah. though it's not as mainstream, I will tell you that there's many studies from extraordinary psychologists who work in academia on the positive possible self of the future and how important it is to not just have a goal, but to actually lean in who am I inside of that future fulfilled? What might it feel like mm 
Amen. to be pregnant, to be happy and loved, to have an engagement ring on my finger and just sitting with it in a, in a visioning, using your imagination and getting it into your body as much as you can. So from that pos possible future to set an intention, which is different than wanting something, mm -hmm. wanting something is like, you know, kind of being a beggar with God, please, I hope it happens please give this to me. I'll be good for the rest of my life if you give this to me. As opposed to, I will hold myself accountable for becoming who I would need to be in order for that future to be fulfilled. Mm, that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember, I think you were, when I first met you, you were single. And I mean, you had been married before. I had been married. I had been married. That was the that was the miracle manifestation of calling in the one was I called yeah. in my first husband, Mark, who I was married to for about a decade, but we met after I was separated from him, or maybe we had even been divorced by yeah, then. I think you but were I, divorced, but I don't know that I had created conscious uncoupling yet. Do you remember? No, that? you had, you had created conscious oh, uncoupling okay. and you were definitely consciously uncoupling coupled and you were beyond that. But what I thought was so cool is, you know, this was later on right before this was right before you le left LA and right after I moved here. So it was probably four years ago. You'll be able to tell me when I tell you what I remember, okay. but you had been single for a while and you, and we, I think we were walking somewhere. I was walking with you to your car and you were like, you know, yeah, I think I'm going to manifest love again. I think I'm ready. <laughs> I, I, said like, that oh. I didn't remember that. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then I saw you like maybe two months, three months later, and you were like, okay, I manifested love. I, it was like, it was just very matter of fact, like, okay, I'm going to manifest. I'm ready now. I'm going to manifest love. You got to tell the story, but you called in this man who you are still with how many years later now almost four That's almost like four years now. look at that boo boo who like adores <laughs> you and you live with him now and your yes, partners in life too. and love and you literally were just like i'm gonna manifest love i'm ready now and then like a few months later that was it you know i did not remember <laughs> that i had said that to you but i was I was, um, you know, I did it in an interesting way this time too, which people love this story. So I'll tell it here. I was, um, you know, we, we have vision board. We all know about the vision yeah, board. Yeah, yeah. And stuff. The value of the vision board is not so much the actual visual. It's the trying on of that possibility for yes. yourself in a way that you feel in your body. You're kind of creating, you're weaving that future, but it has to kind of run through your body. If you're doing a vision board and it's kind of like, oh, I wish I had that. Oh, I wish I had yeah, that. That's stop, not stop, help. stop. <laughs> not going to help. So I knew that it, you know, as a teacher of love, as the creator of calling in the one, I knew that I needed to get the, the possibility in my body. And Laura, I'm just a woman like everybody else. And I was in my 60s already. And I thought, oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm too old. That was my version. Yeah. Then, yeah. oh, I'm maybe I'm too old. And I have this, you know, daughter who's in college. And that's a big expense going out every month. You know, whatever we tell ourselves, right? Of why we can't have it. So this is me. I had people supporting me, mm -hmm. right? So I had my friends, um, Isaac and Terald Corin. And I said to them, well, I want to do a CD about love. And I want to take people on the journey of losing love, forgiveness, getting into a consciousness of love, the having of love. So I'm going to do like a musical vision board. Mm. And they you're were, a they, singer. People don't know I'm that. I'm a singer songwriter. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, and I'd never made a CD before. I used to be a cabaret singer for many years, but yeah. then, and then, you know, that passed in my thirties. So it was a joy to go back to music. So I'm writing all these songs and we're recording them. I couldn't write the last one. They wrote beautiful music, but the, 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 the lyrics of that song needed to be the having of love. This is what ah, it was. Yes. And I couldn't get into the center. It was like, I could kind of dance around it. So I, I call Isaac one day and I say, and this is, you know, this is inside your question. Like, what's the value of having someone who's holding the high watch with you and, and working with you? So I call him. I said, I'm just in non-possibility. I just, it's really hard for me to imagine it. And he sits and he talks to me and he just opened up space and I got it. And I got off the phone and literally I picked up a pen and I wrote these lyrics. 
sitting by the fire on a Saturday night, reading David White by the flickering light. I look up and you're smiling. Aww, it's only that just gave me chills. Aww. It's only been a year since the night that we wed when we danced till dawn, then lay flowers in our bed as the sun started rising. And it goes on. I mean, it's quite poetic and has all and it just flowed images. right out. It just, it really just flowed right out when I was in the center of it. This mm -hmm. is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. This is what it smells like. The this flowers. is like this, what the scene would be. Yes. Yes. And trying that on and in my imagination, feeling it as though it's so. So I go in and I record the song. We do not have a name for this song. I'm just calling it the I love you song, but it doesn't, yeah. you know, which is not a great name. <laughs> and a few weeks later, I meet Michael in this very magical, circuitous way. And, and within three weeks, without knowing this lyric, without hearing this song, he sends me a David White poem. Wow. So now the song is called Michael's Song. Aww. And it's on the CD, Lucky in Love. So, which is iTunes for any of you who want to listen to. Yeah, it. I love that. So love we're that weaving story. it. Yeah, we're weaving it in consciousness first. It's love really from the inside out. And as I, as we talk about all the time with quantum love, that's, that's it. Like that getting in what you did in that, mm -hmm. in that example is you moved into the frequency of that, which you desired you were, you know, being in the first person imaginative experience of it. And I know you have all sorts of strategies for helping people do this as they're calling in the one, right. But moving into the reality of that, as if it were happening already, as if it were already here, moves your body into the frequency of that communicates with the quantum field. And that's really the secret behind the secret. So, so it's just such a beautiful example of that. Because even to be able to write those words, when you say you went into the center of it, that's what you're saying, that you went into the scenario as if it were happening right here, right now in first person. What would that look like? What would the scene be? Yeah. How would I feel? How? Let me employ all my senses. That's how you move into the frequency of that. Which right. You create. Yeah. So it has to begin with that yeah. as yeah. a foundation, right? So as much as people can, not everybody can do it immediately. Right to move into even, even for a, a 30 seconds of possibility, because there's so much evidence to the contrary. Yeah. People feel at the effect, you know, most people go to, uh, you know, psychics and get readings about love and stuff. I had one woman who came to me um, for calling in the one. And before we began the course, she went to her psychic. He said, I'm so sorry to tell you, but you're not going to have a partner in this lifetime. Ooh. I know it's as he was done. How practice that guy. So, so, so luckily she came anyway, and she was willing to do the process. She went back to him. I don't know why she went back to him, but she went back to him for something work related. I guess they were friends or something. And she went back to him for something like four weeks later. And he, he guessed, she put all the cards out and he guessed, he said, what did you just do? You just changed your whole future. Let me Ooh. tell you about your husband. Wow. Right. And then, of course, she was married the following year to a lovely man. So, you know, these things, it's really important that we recognize that the universe is not, it's not fixed. It's yeah. not static, that we influence life. We influence life, but not from our will. I want this to happen. So it's really this very deep internal process. However, here's, here's the thing that Calling in the One really does beautifully, because it's a 49-day program. Mm -hmm. There's also missing development, development that did not get taught in your home or even inside of the, the freeze of the trauma that you were in, where you kind of didn't learn certain skills and capacities that are necessary to sustain a healthy relationship. Yeah. So what we're doing essentially, when we go into that positive, possible self of the future, is we're asking this question, who am I here? What will I need to give up in order to manifest this future? How will I need to now grow in order to sustain it mm -hmm. once it arrives? And what is my next step? Yeah. And what I think is so beautiful about this is, and you were alluding to this earlier, this 
definitely works. I've seen it work time and time and time again of, you know, for calling in love, but what you're actually also doing at the same time is healing and resolving and releasing old stories and wounds that have been holding you back in all sorts of ways in your life that you have no idea about, you know, that you may not even realize, right? Not just in love, but it may be take keeping you from taking chances in your career or stepping into new possibilities in, in your friendships or in your hobbies or in your passions. So what I think is so beautiful about it is that it's absolutely about love, but it's fundamentally about healing and releasing those limiting stories that we unconsciously integrated and adopted and worked into our whole identity and personality. Yeah, yeah. And we're ever evolving creatures. So it once you once you point yourself in the right direction. So, you know, I, I I'm really wanting to um well I am creating a training for therapists. I, I do train a lot of therapists and I was at UCLA recently training therapists on this future focus. Mm -hmm. Because when you when you start leaning in, you remember um you you remember to initiate the growth of skills and capacities that might have been stunted in the home that you grew up in. Yeah. And, and so can and, you talk, let's talk about some of those. Yeah. Uh, because you know, I know what you're talking about, right? But let's give some examples. So inside of the assumption that you um, are not good enough, for example, inside of that assumption, in your relationships with others, you're always in, you're always at a deficit. You're coming in at a deficit and you need to prove yourself constantly. You might develop a habit, like a habitual way of relating where you're over giving constantly and over functioning and saying yes to everything mm -hmm. and not necessarily setting boundaries because there's this feeling like I'm not good enough and I have to really earn someone's love all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And it creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. So some of the missing development in that is the recognition of uh, even what you even feel and need in any given moment before you'd need jerk say, yes, I'll do that. Or the ability to hold your own um, anxiety when it comes up and soothe yourself mm -hmm. that it's okay to disappoint somebody that if they leave the relationship because you have taken care, you took care of yourself by saying no, that it's probably not a healthy enough relationship to be investing in. Um, it's the ability to uh, reclaim or even recognize your healthy needs for reciprocity. Yeah. To validate those needs. Right. So all of these things, I'm just talking about the intrapersonal, you know, right. interpersonal is different intrapersonal where you, you, you even validate your own needs as important. Even know what they are. Even know what they are. Be able to differentiate them from the unhealthy needs. Like I yep. need to be the center of attention all the time because I am insatiable, which is an unhealthy need that is actually based in a false center. You know, here's the thing about if you're walking around somatically anchored in these beliefs, you're cutting off your desires constantly yep. because they're occurring as neediness or they're occurring as painful because if you really believe that you cannot get what you want, you cannot get what you need, it becomes, it becomes almost masochistic to let yourself just feel into your desires for love and partnership yeah. and what might that experience you don't let yourself. You, you yeah. really can't go there. It's too painful. Yeah. But when you're in <clears throat> what we call power center, that place where I have, you know, I came here to be seen, I came here to have an impact, or I do matter, I matter to myself. It's appropriate for me to expect that my feelings and needs would matter to anyone that I let into my inner circle. You know, you add, so I'm calling that power center, which is really the center of truth. And you're somatically centered there then you can show up in ways that actually generate health and can transform your life very, very quickly. Because when you show up in a, in a new way, other people relate to you very differently. Very differently. Yeah. I can do that for you. Or thank you for telling me that. Or yeah. yes, I understand that boundary was hard to set, but I completely get it. And I respect you. You know, and if you're doing that for the first time, you get off the, you know, the treadmill of trying to prove yourself 
and you're connected to yourself. And then you set a boundary with someone and you find out, oh, they actually still. The sky didn't me. fall on my head. <laughs> the world didn't, didn't come to an me. end. They didn't abandon <laughs> me, right? I didn't die. Well, listen, you've, we've had these conversations, you and me, um, about, because I've struggled a lot with boundaries through the years in love, not in other ways, but certainly in love because of my upbringing. And so I think what's important to say is that it's not just understanding the nuances of it and feeling entitled to do it and doing that internal work to claim it. It's also like through the, through the years, I think even as recently as last year when, when we were in the Redwoods together and I was coming back and I wanted to set some new boundaries with my husband and I was really anxious about it. Yeah. And, and so you were actually giving me words. And so, so it's not just like that internal understanding of deserving boundaries and cultivating and even knowing what those boundaries are. If you weren't, if, if in order to survive your childhood, uh, you integrated an identity naturally and in order to survive that doesn't allow for boundaries, for instance, you don't even know how to set them right? You don't even know what to say. So there's right. like this practical right. side as well as there is the preliminary side of yeah. like even feeling like you deserve boundaries or that it's okay to set them or that the world, you know, won't fall apart if you do. And you have to do that on the court. You have to take risks. And as I yeah. and as you said, before you start doing it with your neighbor, with your friend, with your coworker, with your mom, you know, you have to start where you are, bloom where yeah. planted. It's very transformative. So that's the, that's the future pulling you into who you will need to be yes. in order to manifest and sustain that future. It's different than analysis, different than understanding, different than even grieving the traumas of our past. You know, I think there's a lot of work that's being done around grieving the past, which is very sacred work, really. I mean, there's beautiful practitioners who are doing that work. And healing and transformation are two different domains. Yeah. And they go hand in hand. Well, but... when you're committed to truly transforming your life, a lot of healing happens quickly. Yes. But the focus is on really creating something outside of the story that you were born into or that yes. you inherited or that you adopted. And some of these stories, as you well know, they're in the lineage. Yeah. Oh they didn't my even God. start with you. You just kind yeah. of breathe them in when you were in the world. I'm from the yeah. I'm not good enough tribe. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's, ge it's genetic and it goes deep, deep, deep. And I think also it's, you know, I always say when I work with people who have trauma histories or, you know, my whole, like, I do not, I'm the same way. I, I think the past informs like understanding that understanding the wounds, understanding what happened, having that compassion for those parts of you, you know, all of that is so crucial, but it, but I think so often therapy is all about staying there. Like, let's go into every detail of it. Let's spend our time there. Let's, and that I don't think serves at all. And I know that a lot of schools of thought are there. What it's, it, and I'll tell you, there's, there's a time when it's the right intervention. Mm -hmm. And then at some point it could be in danger of shifting into something that's not healthy because yeah, what we, what, from a metaphysical perspective, what we focus on grows. Yeah. And if your attention goes, energy perfect. flows. Right. So if you keep putting all of your attention on the, the, the abandoned three-year-old or the unloved seven-year-old, and, and that's where you think you need to be in order to finally be free. In some ways, at some point you start inadvertently strengthening yeah. that sense of self. So it's important to know that identity is fluid. The only identity that's not fluid is the traumatized self who got fixed. And that's the default self that we tend to go to when we're disappointed or when we're right. anticipating disappointment, we're projecting disappointment, possible disappointment. And then we'll kind of overly identify with that self. That's a phenomenon that most of us know when you're kind of out on a date or something's happening in the beginning of a relationship maybe. And you feel like you're 12 inside, you're showing up as a grown up. you're trying to be cool, but you feel, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. 11 or something. So that's because you're overly identified with that younger that you, part, yeah. right? That wounded self. So I, so we have to learn 
one of the core skills that we're learning and, and um, I love Stephen Gilligan who's, who created self relations therapy because I learned this from him, but it's about how to create a mentoring kind of sponsoring relationship with that younger wounded self mm -hmm. so that we're actually present as an adult with resources as a spiritual self as a person of wisdom and depth and compassion and education. And, uh, and then the resources that many of us have of being uh, a kind best friend or yeah. a kind parent who knows how to bring comfort. So it's to get, it's to identify with that self and bring that self into relationship with that seven-year-old. Yeah, that that's a really beautiful healing when that happens. So you were saying that, you know, the resignation piece that is so common when people kind of are saying, okay, I, I you know, it's not going to be for me, right? I'm resigned that I'm not worthy of love. I can't sustain love, love leaves, whatever that story is, right? Part of what you're saying, you said you can resolve, we were going to come back to it. And I think we did. Yeah, resignation. Yeah. Well, what, resignation lifts fairly quickly in calling in the one and, and, and possibility opens up the moment you start to see yourself as the source of the pattern. Mm -hmm. and of sustaining the, simplest, the pattern for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and on the simplest level, we, we turn towards the parts of you that don't actually want that. Yeah. Don't trust that you're not going to give yourself away or that don't think that uh, others are trustworthy in some way based on past trauma. The part of you that knows that you do not have, you know, good boundaries with men that you throw yourself under the bus the moment you like someone or the part of you that's still hoping that your ex-boyfriend comes back because you had, <laughs> you know, some yeah. pledge of loyalty that, you know, in a moment of passion, you're the only man I'll ever love, or you promised yourself that you would never let yourself be taken advantage of like that again. Yeah. So you're walking yeah. around, you know, with walls uh -huh. up. Uh -huh. So these are all the ways that we're incomplete with the past. Once you are even name one of them, how am I the source of this pattern of going out with narcissistic men all the time? How am I the source? It's very easy. We know as therapists, people, oh, my last was a narcissist and very yeah. easy to be very angry yeah. at that person because, you know, they behave quite badly and, uh, and, and hurtfully. So of course, you know, our attention mm -hmm. goes there, but where we want our attention is on to, in the, to the subtle ways that we turned away from ourselves, kind of rode the coattails on somebody who knew exactly what needed to happen at all times, gave our power away to them because somehow it abdicated our own responsibility for our lives. You know, it's important to say, I didn't yeah. really want to be responsible for my yeah. life. That was, that was, so we have to going. own our hundred percent in the life we've created, even not to say it's our fault because these things happen subconsciously, right. but to recognize it. I mean, one of my favorite questions that I always end up asking when I'm working with anyone, because this is when the resistance comes up is, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen if this problem were solved, right? If this relationship issue were resolved, if you were to find the perfect, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? And that's exactly you know, where the that's resistance it. Is. What a great yeah. question. Cause that's going to bring that up. Well, then I'd have to be actually responsible for somebody yeah. else's life. In addition yeah. to my own, I'm not really yeah. sure I want to do that. Right. I like having right. my freedom and just thinking about myself. Yeah. So we or have I'll to lose myself or I'll whatever. Yeah. You know? And I so, think, so this is, so this is where development comes into yeah. because sometimes people say, well, you know, I can't set boundaries because my dad, blah, blah, blah. And I always say, well, try on the word won't. Like I won't set boundaries because I'm unwilling to risk that someone might be mad at me like my father was. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for choice points and volitionality, remembering that we're grown now. Yeah. And that we have at our fingertips teachers like Dr. Laura Berman, who can teach us all about <laughs> happy, healthy love. You know, the skills of the skills of healthy relating are everywhere. Yeah. So I want people to be as interested in naming and identifying the missing development and getting busy, you know, filling in the blanks in those places so that they feel confident in their capacity to have relationships. So for example, if one of the things I do in, um, in the section around completing your past is I look for where 
where the resentments are. Who do you still resent? And usually it's a, you know, it's an ex-boyfriend or maybe it was a stepfather or maybe it's yourself, you know, but, but what I'm looking at is, yeah, there were mistakes made, there was bad behavior and there were consequences to those. What were the choices you actually made that allowed that to happen? What were your choice points, right? right. right? So, you're, so when, when I look at that 3%, 97% the other person's fault, well, what were the behaviors? What were the choices? What's the pledge to myself and how I'm going to do this differently? The practice I need to take on. I will never, ever again turn away from red flags. Mm -hmm. I will never again be in a relationship where I'm not asking for what I need right yeah. from the beginning, right? These are very hard lessons. Or my boundaries learn. aren't respected or where I, yeah, absolutely. You know, these are commitments you, you have to make to yourself, like from that conscious place. And I feel like the universe listens when you do. And take, and take action in the direction of, of those dreams. You know, that's when things start to shift radically and rapidly. So there's a certain fidelity to the future self mm -hmm. and to finding our way to that future. And one step at a time with, you know, it takes great courage to do it. And, uh, and, and sometimes it takes accountability partners and yes. you know people to be on the inside with you cheering for you and uh and i've seen countless miracles manifest and then there's grace and then there's just grace yes well let me ask you this hold on i, I just want to make sure my phone's off let me ask you this um it, someone's listening and they are wondering like you know about this because i think what i i really like this course I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about, you know, this idea of, because what I, I do this too, you know, I'll take courses that I'm interested in for my own life, even if I don't know if it's something that I want to do for practice, right? Like you were saying, a lot of people take the calling in the one coaching course who don't even plan on being coaches when they, and some of them probably still don't plan when they finish, but they've obviously done a lot of growing and learning. Um, but who, who is the right person for this kind of course? You know, thank you for that. I mean, we have therapists who are very seasoned. We have coaches who are working coaches and other modalities and want to move into the love coach, the relationship coach space. But we also have what we call lay people. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are coming from all sorts of different professions. And they're usually people who have uh, kind of a big heart for other people who really genuinely care about other people. They are people who uh, others tend to gravitate towards you for advice because you mm -hmm. have wisdom. Um, there are people who are deeply committed to their own healing and transformation and want a structure and a support. You know, I, I, I have a cap on how many people we take into the training because it's so hands-on. It's not just a virtual watch these videos, read these books. Yeah, no, I've seen you're really interacting with them in vivo I'm, and working with I'm them. I'm with yeah. them. And in the coach training, you get a mentor coach, you get a circle with, you're one of eight mm -hmm. with a mentor coach, an apprentice mentor coach, you meet with them. You also have, uh, we have optional weekly coaching calls with our senior calling in the one coaches for your own personal development. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of holding, there's a lot of relatedness, there's a lot of safety. Some people say that they've never been in such a, a safe, nurturing environment. So we, we kind of, we, we, we decided early on that we were going to create something that would replicate who we want our coaches to be for others. So we give that to our coaches yeah. and I, I invest a lot in my coaches because I, I see them as those who are on the front lines with me, spreading these teachings throughout the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the teachings of being able to live from the future backwards, that there is no fixed future, that whatever happened to you in your past does not have to determine what's possible. Not, for like you Paolo Coelho wrote, you don't have to do, you don't have to believe the story of your life. You've been told. I love that line. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, yeah, that, that that's not fixed. I think that's really, really amazing. And so I'm going to put, we have in the notes, uh, in the summary of the podcast, we have the link to this course. 
Um, and I'll post about it on social media. And I know you will too, Catherine. If people want to follow you, they find you on social media, Catherine Woodward Thomas. Is that, or is that your? Yeah. Tag? Yeah. And you know, my website, Catherine Woodward Thomas.com. And um, so the, the, the call that we have to find out about the, the upcoming coach training is coaching my sacred calling Ooh. is what Laura is uh, putting into the chat. And we'd, and you, and also I don't do a high sell thing for, for anyone who gets nervous about that. Um, we have coaches who are available to talk to you about their coaching practices and about studying and taking the program so that you just hear it from another coach who's not a trained salesperson. Right. So they're not going to be like, and if you get, if you do this in the next five minutes, you'll get mm -hmm. a free whatever. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I really I like giving things away for free, but right. <laughs> but not, not, not as a exchange. Not as a, yeah. So I know a lot of us shy away from, I don't want anyone selling me anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, you know me, I'm your biggest fan and my husband teases you because anytime I say your name, I always say Catherine Woodward Thomas. I just never, that's just like always your full like name. Like it's one Catherine name. Woodward Thomas. Like yeah. it's just one name. Yeah. He's like, so what are you doing? I'm about to talk to Catherine Woodward Thomas. <laughs> like I just always say the whole name together. I love you so much. I love, love, love the work that you do in the world. I am so grateful to you for doing it yeah. and um, for helping so many of us heal. And I hope you guys check it out. Check out the course, check out the books not only calling in the one, but conscious uncoupling, which we didn't even get into. We'll have to do another conversation about that when you're, when you're, uh, how you can heal past love so that you can move forward. I know you, you cover that in calling in the one, but anytime you want me back, out. you just let me know. I'll come and, you know, do the alphabet with you. Just sit with me. <laughs> just recite the alphabet. <laughs> Sounds you, like Laura. fun. Thanks Much for love. having me.